Welcome to the Agile Advocate Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Drew, and I'm here with Adam Furtado, Branch Chief at Kessel Run. Welcome to the podcast, Adam. Thanks. Appreciate you having me. So, as we do with all our guests, get a uh, rundown on how you became the Branch Chief at now the famous Kessel Run. It's a long story, so see how much time we have here, but I think it was a, a lot of serendipity and a lot of events that took place, a lot of people in the right place at the right time, kind of all came together for us to take advantage of momentum that already existed in a lot of ways. And we try to find ways to uh, capitalize on that, I'd say. So I think the the story has two core characters, the first of which uh, Colonel Enrique Oti, who's currently the commander of Kessel Run. He, uh, in mid-2016, was part of standing up DIUX out in uh, Silicon Valley with the goal of bringing together warfighter needs and Silicon Valley technology and see if we could really move the government in the direction we wanted to go. And uh, in doing that, long story short, partnered with Pivotal Labs to try to teach active duty airmen how to build software in a modern way using best practices that, has been, that have been used you know, throughout industry. While that was going on, there was a small group of us up at Hanscom Air Force Base in the middle of a traditional Air Force program office trying to move the needle in in a real way, trying to take our legacy code bases and capabilities and figure out how to get them into the cloud, get to continuous delivery in some way, scratching and clawing however we could. And those kind of two paths have met. And uh, Captain Brian Kroger, who was kind of leading that effort with Hanscom Air Force Base at the time, got together with Enrique and kind of stars aligned. Uh, while that was happening, the AOC, or the Air Operations Center Weapon System, was in the midst of a 10-year, six, $700 million effort to modernize the way that we plan and, and execute air warfare around the world without much delivery. They were a case study in you traditional were, government. You have some of those delivery times too, don't you? Yeah, yeah. They're, so, they're almost unbelievable. It, it's almost, it's a... A literal case study, I think. It would actually would be fascinating if somebody actually did the work on it. But we were doing everything wrong, everything that we, we talk about now that we've learned over time. We were hitting all those points. So at that point, the AOC program office basically went and asked Congress for more money. Uh, they were like, I don't think so. We're kind of done with this. Let's see if we can find a new way to kind of tackle this problem, connected with some of the work and momentum that uh, Enrique and Brian had going And the rest is history in some form. So uh, throughout that period, we started a small project that was really successful. We call it Jigsaw. It's our Tinker Planner application. And with that, we were able to prove out that we were able to take what works in industry and some of those patterns and actually apply them within the government and tackle all the bureaucratic hurdles that started to appear uh, along that path. So I saw um, one of your uh, presentations. Um, You talked about culture. Mm-hmm. culture and kind of the the courageous people that you talk about that take that step. Sometimes it's because of pain, right? Mm-hmm. It's just like, I can't believe we're spending this much money and we still don't have anything, right? So when Congress says no more, that's kind of a push too. But there's also those kind of innovators and those people that step out. And you probably mentioned a few of those. Absolutely. I think one thing that, uh, gets lost out of the there were about five of us or so that kind of were leading this effort from the beginning three out of the five come from the operational community so i'm a former intelligence professional as a targeteer so it, an operational just to make sure we understand is in the air force operational means right that actually that's a really good point because that uh, leads to confusion everywhere yeah i mean operational is that i was uh deployed overseas supporting war fighters to get their job done so I was a user, right? So I, we had people who came from the user community who have had full careers of not getting capability they needed to get their job done to be able to try to do their job despite the tools given to them instead of being enabled by them. Keep working around the shiny rocks. That's right. So we had a, um, we had perspective. I say when people ask me, like, oh, are you a technologist? I'm really not. I don't have a very technical background. I bring perspective to the table. And so I came in and I had a perspective of being able to know what it's like to be a user and not even not have the tools I need, but know they weren't coming. There was no light at the end of the tunnel. We had to figure out how to do our job with what was available to us. And that's what's happening around the DOD right now. There are just amazingly smart people all over the world who are just scratching and clawing and finding creative ways to get their jobs done because the, there's a mission to get done. And they're, they, but and, you talk about one thing in there is like 
Culture, and I totally agree with this. Culture, everyone wants to look at the tools, the technology, and you you know flip a bit here and that. Because I'm a technology guy. I'm a software developer, mm-hmm. and I love the tools, the bells and whistles. But the biggest one to conquer, the biggest rock to push is culture. Mm-hmm. It's insanely ingrained. But you had that really interesting, um, you brought up about Google's Aristotle project? Is that what it was? Yeah, exactly. Talk a little bit about that. Sure. So uh, I, I get myself in trouble sometimes, but I think technology is irrelevant in a lot of ways in some of these conversations. The, the first thing we had to focus on is not only how do we tackle the requirements process and acquisition and technology and all these things, which all became important in their own way, but how do we change the way we even think about work uh, within our organization? Uh, and it starts with culture. So it's really fascinating. So uh, Google did this study called Project Aristotle where they started doing uh, kind of surveying around their teams and they wanted to find out what makes teams effective, what makes the good ones good and the and the bad ones n- not as good, right? And it came to a bunch of different kind of characteristics and there were five that stood out and, and four of them were structure, discipline, meaning, and impact. And if you read that, it's that's DOD, military That, that just sounds like yeah, military, right? That's what we do, right? We, and then <laughs> people in the military will say, well, no, we don't do, we, we're the military. Like, well, that's what you, how you deliver yeah. software. Yeah, there is one thing we're good at in the, in, the, in the military is alignment, right? Like the hierarchical way that we organize and we achieve success on a battlefield, everybody knows their job. Everybody knows what we're here to do. We have a singular mission. We're really focused. So it actually kind of translates fairly well to a software organization. Where we missed the mark, though, is the number one thing that came out of that study was this idea of psychological safety, this yeah. idea that people I need to – Yeah, it's, 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 it's really core, I think, to our core values and principles at Kessel Run is that we knew that we weren't going to be able to deliver what we need to with an old way of working, which means we get people in a room and we have all of our enlisted guys in the corner doing whatever the, the officers tell them. And we knew we wanted to kind of flip that model on its head make people feel really free to be creative and ideate, make sure the best idea wins in the room, make sure there's not a fear of failure. So we did that in a few different ways. First, we don't wear any uniforms in our organization. I bet uh, that went over great at first, huh? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, we... we, we, No, I mean, I can imagine an officer just walking in there or a colonel going... Okay, I, I'll let it give it a try. Sure, yeah. So we uh, right now we wear we wear uniforms on Wednesdays, right? Okay, now, they're called Warrior Wednesdays. <laughs> For the most part, we don't wear uniforms, and the idea is that you know, on some teams we have right now a product manager who's uh, an admitted listed guy, E five who has a designer who's a captain and there are like high paid contractors on the team and some other active duty folks. And we don't want that to be a thing. We don't want people to think about that uh, all day long. And one of the coolest things that I see around Kessel Run is if you went throughout our, uh, you know, our production area, we probably have, you know, dozens of, you know, industry partners helping us in some form, different contracting companies. But if you ask them who they work for, they'll all tell you, well, I work for Kessel Run, right? Which is a really cool thing to hear because it's a really, it's a badgeless environment when we're there. And the last thing I think about is somebody's employer. So, so you drop the alignment with your contractor and you feel like you've been sucked into the Kessel Run team. Yes. I would say that that's actually happening and it's really heartening to see that. So you also talk about, you know, that sounds great, mm-hmm. but you don't eat this elephant all at once, right? You talked about small successes getting runways. Mm-hmm. Talk to me more about that. <laughs> I did a talk recently where I, I attributed or, or compared my last two years to uh, playing a video game. And the idea here is that every step along the way, we think we're like out of the woods, right? So the first thing that happens, we have to figure out how to tackle, uh, you know, the security process or continuous ATO. We can talk more about that. But as we go through that, then like we, we're we jumping over barriers and avoiding pitfalls. And you finally get to the end of this level and you've tackled how to tackle, you know, government security. We figured it out. But at the end of the level, you think you're done, but there's just another level to go, right? So every step along the way, there's just a new bureaucratic hurdle for us to tackle. And the way that we had to, we, we got lucky and good about doing that or the, the way that we kind of had success there was by having that first win. The idea that we had Jigsaw, Tanker Planner Tool, we were able to take make a web application with active duty Air Force personnel and continuously deliver it into production, into operations. We've got to prove it out. So it wasn't no more, there wasn't PowerPoint slides. It wasn't theory. Uh, we were able to show that Air Force members can develop really good software and deliver it and maintain it in production. And all of that is happening in the middle of a war. Right. So we were able to kind of prove that out. So with Jigsaw, we uh, delivered that in in a few months, the first iteration went out and we were able to find enough efficiency by, you know, taking a manual process and building software for it that we were saving on average one tanker aircraft from having to be used every single day. Which is how much money? 
Uh, it worked out at the time to about $250,000 a day and just in fuel savings. That's right. not manpower maintenance, and maintenance, maintenance all, of all that. Wow. And then you know, this idea of software is never done, right? We didn't pack up and go home and do something else. We continued to iterate. We deployed that software about 30 more times over the next 12 months. We're able to double that savings uh, where now we're saving almost $12 million a month in fuel savings alone, uh, which is pretty exciting to see. But the, the thing we got lucky at is that majority of our products and the things that we work on in this kind of command and control mission space aren't going to have dollar values associated with it. We got really lucky that we were able to, to choose an application that allowed us to show tangible ROI that helped us translate what we do to government folks who didn't get it, right? But they got dollars and cents. So uh, everybody gets dollars and cents. Everybody gets that. So uh, that, that small win helped us kind of really open the door of like trying to scale and move the needle and find out what that next kind of bureaucratic hurdle we had to tackle was and then kind of go after that. So one of the things that, you know, amazing, I've been doing this for 35 years in D.C., but I only have done it in the government for like four or five years. Mm-hmm. So somehow it's my wife who's been doing it for 35 years in the government says, I don't know how you just got away from that. But now that I've been in the government, I thought I had all the bad perceptions of the government. What's really impressive about it, there's a lot of hardworking, talented people in the government. Mm-hmm. One of the things that is just the approach hampers them in so many ways. And plus, they don't have the continuity that I think you all got with your airmen continuity across contractors and of phases. As I, as you say, own that, contractors can go as they augment me, but I have that core competency that I can get all the way through my product. Is that what you guys were aiming at with Airmen? Uh, to, a, to a point, I actually think we don't have that. Uh, mm-hmm. We actually started Kessel Run on the backs of TDYing Airmen in, so getting people temporarily. So when we were trying to find the talent throughout the Air Force, so the, the good thing about the situation we're in is that there are talented airmen all over the Air Force mm-hmm. who are highly skilled. There are people who code at home and they are just technically proficient and they can do this job. The problem is they're in some other career field right now who doesn't, that doesn't allow them to do that, right? So you have somebody who is, you know, whether it's maintaining an aircraft or, or what have you, they're coding on the side. Frustrated software developers. Yep. How do I go get that talent? So what we, we tried to do is uncover all the rocks we could uncover. It was certainly like a grassroots effort to go out and say, who in the Air Force has this talent? I don't care what your job is in, in reality. I will take somebody who can do software development. And I will assess your ability and I'll pay for you to come in to Kessel Run for six, 12 months. Did you actually reach out throughout the, so- the Absolutely. airport? Absolutely. Yeah, we sent out. Okay. It was, I mean, uh, it's funny looking, listening back on it, but we had, you know, we just sent out calls for applicants for, to all over the Air Force through. How many did you get? Um, What's the number? Rough number. Uh, a little over 100, probably, okay. over the course of that kind of year and a half stretch. I mean, we were going through Facebook groups and, and all kinds of stuff to try to find the right people. And I will say now that Air Force corporate structure at the executive level has recognized this, and they're putting processes in place to make this a, a real a real reality going forward, which what, is really you interesting. Like be able to figure out what's out there? And yeah, so there's, think- a, there's a couple of cool initiatives they're doing. One is an uh, initiative that will pay people who have software development skills the same as people who have uh, language proficiencies. So in the Air Force, if you can speak Russian, uh, even if you don't do that job, they'll give you incentive pay to keep up with that and keep keep practicing. They'll test you every once in a while. We're doing the same thing with software development languages now, which is really cool to see, uh, as well as uh, there's a bunch of things getting rolled out, being led by uh, Lauren Knossenberger, the Chief Transformation Officer for the Air Force, on how to uh, upskill digital talent uh, across the service, which is really cool to see. So all these things we were kind of tackling at our little small level, mm-hmm. starting to scale now and people recognizing it as like a... Uh, that was issue. the word I was looking for, scale. Mm-hmm. So you can't do it through a, uh, one tunnel. You can't go and say, well, if you give it the Kessel Run, they'll be able to do it. Then your backlog looks ridiculous, mm-hmm. right? So it's to build more use and then be able to take that out what we have been calling it, we, we, we steal from the Palm Pilot, and yeah, I know that really ages me, Palm Pilot and the Apple mm-hmm. of evangelists. So you as an evangelist, moving forward, taking the best practice and basically populating throughout and pollinating throughout the Air Force, mm-hmm. that you don't just go away. And that you's like, well, I wonder how they did it. Well, you not only show what you should do, but how you can do it. 
So it really encourages people to be more like what you're doing. Yeah, there's a couple of things things there that I think are important. One is that I think externally, if you look at Kessel Run, it feels like, oh, this is a side, like a little innovation effort off to the side. When in reality, we were a traditional program office in the middle of Hanscom Air Force Base, the belly of the beast from an acquisitions perspective, right? So this was a transformation effort in any way you slice it. And I think it's important for people to understand that, that if you are stuck in – uh, what feels like an insurmountable problem within the acquisitions world or whatever. There is a path here, right? And people are, are, are there to help. The other part is that uh, all of these kind of software efforts that are uh, growing around the Air Force, software factories, what have you, most of them have, were born out of Kessel Run in some form, which is really great for us to see. It makes us really proud that we've had folks who did a stint, whether that's TDY, like I mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. or they were assigned at Kessel Run. Then they went to a different organization and – tried to recreate some of that and, and we're seeing it work, which is so really So you're cool. doing the evangelist. Yeah, I think it, I don't I know stole if I can take the, credit for it, but it was fairly organic, I think. But uh, I yes. stole from the Jesuits. Yeah. So go. go forth and spread the good word. Right. right? And I, I think so. I think what we're seeing now, and again, you had uh, Mr. Shalon on recently. Yeah. I think they're taking the approach of how do, I, how do I scale this, right? He actually mentioned this in the podcast, I think. How do you scale what Kessel Run did to, to get those larger outcomes we're trying to achieve? So they're taking the approach of, okay, I need to have as much enablement as possible. How do I have tools and um, platforms and infrastructure available to allow disparate organizations who want to build products and capabilities the ability to do that? So I think we're focusing on that now. We're also seeing that with like enterprise uh, IT. I, enterprise IT is a service within the Air Force to try to take commercial business tools and make that more available and help our networks and kind of this base core foundational stuff that Air Force should do better. And now I think we're going to get into a, a position in the next year or so where we have to start focusing on products. Now, how do we make the Air Force a product organization who is focusing on ensuring that we are delivering value to users? We can measure that in a meaningful way and we can start uh, actually kind of achieving mission outcomes we want to achieve because we've done got the uh, technology and the enablement available for people to do that. So I think that's kind of our next mm-hmm. step. Okay, so you're a chief product officer, or you used to be, right? How are you measuring customer satisfaction? I mean, you can measure customer satisfaction when you've got a low-hanging fruit, right? When you've got the guy going, oh, my gosh, I can finally do something. I'm saving entire flights, all yeah. this money. That's great. So how do you get – how do you measure that customer satisfaction on a less obvious basis? Yeah, I think the, the title thing is actually a really good example of, like, what I'd like to talk about there in that – the, the problem that we have is translation, right? So the different people in this, in this you know, uh, ecosystem that I live within all speak different languages. So if you go work and walk through Kessel Run, you'll hear a language that you probably hear in a traditional software organization, mm-hmm. the lean and agile concepts and things like that. But when it leaves our office, we have to learn how to translate that into languages that are different. As an example, if I go and work with a user, somebody who's out, hands-on keyboard, all that guy cares about is like doing his job easier. He comes into work every day. He does this one small part of this large machine. Sometimes doesn't even understand like what what the larger outcome What's they're the trying big to contact, with the big yeah. So we need to figure out, okay, how can we make your job easier? That's what you care about. But on the other hand, there are users at a higher level. Let's call them, you know, air operations center commanders or people who are doing at a combatant command. They care about how do I make sure that I'm prepared for a peer-to-peer war fight, right? So now I have to make sure that, okay, I'm doing user-centered design. I'm learning what users need hands on keyboard. We also have to talk about business value or what are the, what's the larger thing that I need to be able to achieve. So that's a different kind of conversation we have. Then if you go beyond that, there are money people involved, right? There are people who give me money to be able to deliver those outcomes. Those people speak an entirely different language, an acquisition side, right? What is your cost, your schedule, your performance? Those are things I don't even think about. I don't care about them, right? Because we're not talking about cost in, in terms of ROI or schedule and your deployment frequency. We're talking about you built a plan up front that we submit to Congress five years in advance to, 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 to guess, right? And how are you doing against that plan? So, But those things are all important. So our problem lies in we're doing all this great work to deliver products. Now I have to make sure and figure, I have to learn what value means to all of these people and try to achieve that, which becomes uh, troublesome. So from a measurement perspective, we are focused on this, especially the last two quarters on like, how do we make sure that we get measurement from the field that is objective and neutral and available. So people can just 
access that data whenever they want to. So internally, we use tools like OKRs uh, to make sure you gather alignment. We have each of our team identifying, like, what is the, the measurable outcome you're trying to achieve with your product? And how do you capture that data and, and you know, keep um, moving the needle there? And then we have to kind of take that and talk about, you know, holistic value. How are we making the Air Force a more lethal fighting force, a more combat capable, and some of these more like nebulous, larger outcomes? So it's a it's a struggle to be sure, because with that, we have to, you know, we're taking this way of working and measurement versus uh, the requirements process, as an example, where traditionally we would be given a list of things to deliver, check a box, and then slap ourselves in the back. About uh, that big, too. Yeah, sometimes. The interesting thing is, you know, you start to sound like is a salesman. And that's what I've been preaching is that, you know, we can, and it's kind of a, it's a, it's not a really um, acceptable term in the government. Yeah. We don't sell. We provide you. Okay. Whatever you might want to call it comes down to is you have to be the bridge between the person that's out there speaking that language, the people who are putting the product together, and even a person who's giving their money. Mm-hmm. So the ultimate salesman of saying, I have to know these, remove those degrees of, diff- of separation and speak their language. Which I, which I think is unfortunate reality for us right now, right? This is not what I want to be doing is going around selling. I want to be building teams and delivering product and, and delivering outcomes. But we have to right now, right? So there, we still live in this kind of transition period where innovation is just like this kind of like – thing that some people do. There's like pockets of it. We haven't found a way to take this kind of innovative approach and just really transform the government or the DOD and how we think and how we work, whether that's fiscally or from an acquisitions perspective. I think we're getting there and there are pockets of, you know, really, you know, real goodness happening. But yeah, I constantly feel like I'm in that 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 selling mode because what I've realized over time is what what I see as obvious value delivery or things that I'm doesn't translate. Again, it goes back to language. Uh, we have to find ways that people who are doing in this innovation space that we can see the results. We have to be able to translate, you know, that measurement into terms that people who aren't speaking our language can understand. So I think it's it's what I focus a lot of my time. I on don't think it's a bad thing, actually. Yeah, I think it's a good thing, and it's what people do in 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 the in the private industry too. Sure, I have to talk to the people with the money, and they don't really care about my delivery velocity. They don't really care how I did that with a CICD pipeline. Mm-hmm. They want to know what am I going to make over this period of time, and uh, when am I going to get my money. But back? even even with that, though, in industry, you can all be aligned over. At the end of the day, I'm trying to increase my revenue. Right. Like depending on what you can be in sales or marketing or IT or whatever, it's pretty it's pretty clear that we all have the same metric for success for the most part. Right. In my world, we don't have that. Right. Mm -hmm. So we have this idea of we're trying to win wars here, which becomes really nebulous and people have different kind of ideas of what that means. So I think that becomes a little bit harder if I if I. One thing that's really hard for me. So uh, I'm a product leader in this space. Right. In reality, I'm building a massive weapon system. So. System of systems, there's all these components to it. There's modern software that we're building. There's legacy hardware and software that exists, radios, what have you. All these things come together to deliver this massive weapon system in order to win a war. Except we're trying to solve for a scenario that's never happened before with people who have never experienced it. And people are just theorizing on what that might look like, right? So if you think of it from a user-centered design perspective, traditionally, you go in and you find the users who are going to use a product and their context matters because they're the ones who are going to be using it. We are largely guessing here in a lot of ways. It's a really hard place for a product organization to be because we are, we're never going to quite know that we're there yet. So it's like a fascinating place to be from a product strategy perspective that I think about a lot. It seems like you need even more agility than even in the private industry because in we're ways. just imagining what we should look like and how we should perform. So let's talk about continuous ATO. Mm-hmm. Help me understand how you got that. That is the holy grail in many ways. There are, you were talking about um, lead times to get it through security. We were insane. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's not unusual, by the way. No, I know. It, yeah. I mean, you're like, wow. And, and you look at that and you're like, my product isn't relevant anymore. My users are going, oh, I've been surviving without you for quite a while. Thank you very much. So how did you get that done? Yeah, so I think uh, the continuous ATO was our our key initial enabler. It changed, opened up doors, and changed everything. And again, a lot of the credit goes back to Lauren Knossenberger, who was kind of leading that effort with us within Kessel Run. But the goal here was we we had to find a way to have a, a conversation around risk, and I think Lauren was willing to have it. The the idea was not we had to be able to t- have a conversation around 
the risk we're taking by going fast or, you know, uh, Let me interrupt you. Who is, what's Lauren's position? Sorry. So she's the chief transformation officer for the Air Force. Okay. And at the time, she was uh, our uh, approving official for kind of this kind of innovation space. Uh, so she was brought in from industry. And uh, she took a look at how we wanted to go forward with delivering software. And she was making comparisons against, okay, there are things we have to improve even, you know, within the way that Kessel Run works. But am I more secure today than I am tomorrow? And will I be more, I'm sorry, am I more secure today than I was yesterday? And when tomorrow will I be more, am I going to continuously improve my security posture uh, going forward? Can I take as much manual steps as possible and automate them? Uh, to, a, to a point, we have a process by which uh, we actually go through the same uh, security controls as an example as any other organization. We just put them into our backlog and automate as much as possible. So we kind of just took some initial early steps uh, to do that, uh, move security as far left as possible, made it part of our development process and not an afterthought after we delivered a thing. Could you repeat uh, that for me, please? <laughs> yeah. So we, uh, we, <laughs> yeah. We, we did both security and testing, right? So we took yeah. security and test and made it part right. of development. It just became... What a crazy concept. Yeah, right. <laughs> so again, I will say that within Kessel Run, we didn't invent anything. I know you didn't, but you know what? Common sense isn't common and understanding what these things really are and how to do them, it's mm -hmm. not that common. Yeah. So I think we, uh, we basically just had really common sense conversation in a lot of ways. And we got, again, we got really lucky that certain people were in certain places who are willing to... Uh, air quote, lean forward and yeah, take some risk. Yeah, your leader there was very open and, and had a good vision. Yeah, I mean, I think we would all tell you that uh, what we're doing is less risky than what we traditionally would do, but that that, that uh, argument doesn't always sell in um, government spaces yet, although it's starting to shift. Um, so I think having the continuous ATO allowed us to take software delivered in an unclassified environment in downtown Boston in our own lab space off of a base with active duty airmen in t-shirts and they were able to build a product and deploy it whenever they wanted to. In an right? unclassified open air space and you could do this. Yeah. I I'm mean, repeating that for a reason. <laughs> yeah. And that was the important part of it. I think uh, some of two of the, like the underlying key things that made it successful that probably get kind of lost in all this conversation are uh, the ability to use commercial internet to be able to do to get access and you're the to Air tools Force. we need. We are the Air Force. And right. again, there's, there's security controls in place sure. on that. You know, you're not like totally open. You're no, open no, no, kimono no. or of anything, but you're not. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so I think being able to have access to modern tools and the and, 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 that, and having our own lab. So we were able to move our people off of a traditional Air Force base, which got us access to tools and technologies we wouldn't have access before. Fundamentally changed the way we thought about work. When you looked around, you weren't in a 12-foot cubicle anymore. You were in a, you know, a modern workspace. Uh, and all that helped us uh, deliver, helps us recruit, uh, but also helps us kind of um, think about the way that we deliver a little bit better. That's amazing because one of the things that, that gets me is the, the ATO wall and the boundary and how it hampers me to the nth degree just to actually build the software. So that kind of leads into software factories a little bit, right? Sure. Talk, talk to me about that. That's one of my favorite subjects that I'm kind of, kind of pushing. <laughs> That's not a term that we, we use within Kessel Run. But I think it's it goes back to that idea of us within the Air Force at least prioritizing uh, enabler functions, right? So the idea that uh, software factories can exist to enable uh, scale to happen eventually once we kind of figure a lot of other things out, I think is really uh, exciting. I think we're there's a lot of great ideas coming to fruition now. We're starting to see some of those start delivering. So. It's an exciting time. I just hope that these aren't just kind of innovative pockets and we can find them actually kind of really transform the way that we, you know, work as a, you know, bureaucracy. Yeah. I mean, um, I hope you're successful because everybody I know keeps pointing at you guys as an example. And I keep on pointing as an example of how we should be able to transform. There's a lot of people that have a, they're trying to do the transformation and you actually talk about, uh, don't use digital transformation term anymore. Just do the cultural, the cultural thing. And if we can get down that road, like those small bits, because a lot of organizations want to go, okay, I'm going to do an entire transformation. And these are really large organizations. Mm -hmm. the, the, the chances of you doing that is really slim. So as an organization, they got the the wins, got to extend the runway and just keep on win and advance kind of thing. That's a, that's a really great example. Well, I agree. You can't you can't do this all at once. I do think that when you're trying to do an effort like Kessel Run was trying to do, 
you can't just do piece parts of it. You can't just do the parts you're interested in. You can't just do the parts that are a little bit easier for whatever situation you're in. You have to tackle all of it in some form. Maybe it's just a lean slice across all of those things, but you have to be able to think about your culture and your talent management and your engineering and your, what you think about product and acquisitions and all, security. All these things matter. And if you don't do any one of those, you're, you're going to fail. Right. So while you can't tackle all that at once, and we certainly haven't tackled all of it yet either, we had to take uh, a slice of each one of those different things and try to at least like move the ball on the field as best we can and get that runway to kind of keep going a little bit further, uh, which can get exhausting for sure. But uh, want incremental progress. Yeah, I could go on forever here, but we're going to wrap it up. Is there anything, um, any big thing on the horizon that we should be looking for from Kessel Run from from you? Kessel Run continues to grow. We are growing our organization every day, it feels like. So we're taking in uh, and hiring and recruiting more folks to come in and, and work for an organization that has an incredible mission and is, is a great place to work. So we're trying to bring in talent from around the government who come with that domain expertise who already know yeah. how the machine works. Right. Bring in some folks from industry who don't, but can bring in some other things uh, and kind of get this really great mixture of you know people and ideas and creativity together to deliver uh, meaningful capabilities to warfighters in production every single day. So, yeah. Well, you're an inspiration to all of us. You got to keep it going because we're following your lead. Appreciate thank you. It. Thank you so much for taking your time. I really appreciate it, Adam. Anytime you want to come back, drag any of your people from Kessel Run or wherever you can, feel free to do so. Great. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. The Agile Advocate is a production of Government CIO Media and Research. For more podcasts, head to governmentcio.com slash podcasts. The Agile Advocate is produced by Amy Kluber. It is hosted by Bill Drew. Edited by Resonate Recordings. Theme music provided by Big Hoax. If you're interested in sponsoring a podcast, contact Joe O'Neill at J-O-N-E-I-L-L at governmentcio.com.